All right. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Shall we seek the Lord's guidance as we open his word for today's study? Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we have need of you. We come before you humbly. We come before you knowing that where two or three are gathered, that you will be also, for you have promised this. We come before you to ask for forgiveness. We come before you, Father, to ask for strength. We come before you to ask for your blessing. We know the times that we are in, Father. We know that our adversary to devour us. Yet, through your strength, the adversary will run. Help us to be prepared to meet the adversary. Guide us, please, in the path that you set before us. Help us to recognize the light that is behind us that lights our way now. Guide us so that we may have faith that in this faith we may rest completely that we may accept this sabbath as a symbol of your blessing that in this study we may find words and symbols for which we need at this time. Direct us now. Be with each one. May your love, your compassion, and your arms be around us all. For this we thank you. For this we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to segue a little bit. This last week, as we were studying in the book of Joshua, we assembled different verses that had to do with Manasseh. One of those verses came out of Numbers verse, or chapter 7. And Numbers chapter 7 dealt with the gifts that each tribe were to give at the dedication of the tabernacle. Now, each of these gifts are measured according to the shekel of the tabernacle. When I did a brief look up, the shekel of the tabernacle was to be 12 grams. A little different from the 11.5 that is the normal shekel. Just as we have seen in the past, that there are different measurements, whether we are dealing with <clears throat> distance, weight, whatever, there's a difference for the tabernacle or the sanctuary, and there is a difference for man. Now, as we looked at this, one of the points that, that I found to be quite interesting, and I'm more than willing to allow anyone that wishes to interject to ask questions or to make their points was that there were a number of animals, those that were offered as burnt offerings, those that were offered as sin offerings, excuse me, those that were offered as peace offerings. When we look through the entire list, 
for the 12 days of these offerings, we come down here and we see that there's a total of 252 animals that were used in these offerings. Is the number 252 significant for us? Uh, yes. Okay. But now here's, here's another point. During this time, there was a series of wagons and oxen that were presented to the different tribes of the sons of Levi. For Gershom, there were two wagons and four oxen. For Merari, there were four wagons and eight oxen. But for the sons of Kohath, there was no wagon and no oxen. Why was nothing of this type presented for the sons of Kohath? Anybody have any ideas? Good question. Never thought about it. Okay. Who were the sons of Kohath? And what was their responsibility within the temple? I was thinking Moses and Aaron. You're thinking Moses and Aaron, and you would be correct. But what was their responsibility? Aaron was a high priest. Right. Aaron was definitely a high priest. At this time, Aaron has passed from the scene. So we have Eliezer as the high priest, and his son Phinehas is being trained. Please consider the sons of Kohath were the the ones of the tribe of Levi that were to carry the Ark of the Covenant. They were given no oxen, they were given no wagon because it was upon them and upon them alone that the Ark was to be carried. I'm going to give you something to think about. What if the spiritual sons of Kohath are the equivalent of the 144,000 today? Oh. There's a message that's to be given to a dying world. The world doesn't realize it's dying. Yet, as I look around, we have so much evidence of how this world is dying. In this world, they wish to have all sorts of ideas about what's going to happen. Yet, are we not given a a message in Revelation 14? Are we not shown that in Revelation 14 that there is a three-step prophetic testing message that is to be given to the world? And yet how well do we understand that message? If the church had understood the message properly in 1888, the church would have been admitted to the wedding feast not long thereafter. But that message was rejected according to what Mrs. White has shown us. 
that message was rejected according to what we've seen in this world. Now, I found it interesting. I don't understand why God led me here. I just got intrigued because it was numbers. For some reason, numbers get locked into my head. So here we have a total number of 264 animals that are being used at the dedication of the tabernacle. Now, 252, we recognize that, right? But what is 264? 26th day of the fourth month. Exactly. Why is the 26th day of the fourth month important for us? Relates to July 18, 2020. Exactly. So we're given more symbols we're given more direction. We're given more waymarks on which we need to pay attention. Now, each of the tribes was to present a silver charger of 130 shekels of weight. Each of the tribes was to present a bowl filled with fine flour and oil with a weight of 70 shekels of weight. Each of the tribes was to present a golden spoon filled with incense. And that golden spoon was to be 10 shekels of weight. Additively, we were to go through this so that by the time we came down here, we came to 1,560 shekels of these chargers. 156, 1560. It wasn't locking into my head until Stephen made a comment. Consider this, brothers and sisters. Isaiah gave a prophecy in Isaiah 7 unto 65 years that Israel should no longer be a people, right? Is that not correct? Yes. Okay. 156 years from 742 BC, when that prophecy was given, brings us to 586 BC. What's important about 586? Brothers and sisters, this is an open book test. Look at the bottom of your screen. What's already there? Five eighty six was the year in which the temple, Solomon's temple, the glorious temple in Jerusalem, was destroyed. So the outward show of the glory of Israel was destroyed. In 1863, the church established an outward show. We are now a legitimate church. We are now recognized according to the laws of the United States. A few years after that, the corporate church was recognized as a church under the laws of the state of 
Mary Land. Why was the state of Maryland founded? Believe it or not, it was one of the states where those that were Catholic could some liberty. Do you recognize that the laws of the state of Maryland require you to agree that Sunday is the Sabbath, that Sunday is the day of worship? And in order to be incorporated under the laws of the state of Maryland, you must agree to abide by this. To me, this is shocking that the church would choose this state, yet this is according to God's order. In 1863, an outward showing was presented. Yet, 100... Uh, what, go ahead. I was saying, what year was the uh, conference uh, headquarters established in Maryland? Do you know what year that was? not right off the top of my head. I'm believing it was somewhere in the, in the 1920s, like 1923 era. Okay. <clears throat> I'll look that up and see if I can get it back to you. Okay, yeah. It'd be interesting to see time between the 1863 and that. <laughs> okay. Maybe there's, some, maybe there's something there, I don't know. <laughs> well, Okay. Yeah, I have to Google that too. And okay. Find out. I'll look through and see if I can get what, what I can find. Now, at 12 grains, that 1,560 shekels of the chargers give us a total weight of 18,720 grains. Is this something that you just, just discovered? Yes. That says, yeah, okay. This, this came from what we were addressing in the morning meetings this last week. Right. I saw, I saw that on this. Okay. <clears throat> now, as we went, as we went through a lot of this, I was intrigued because I saw this and I'm thinking, okay, were there different gifts? And then when I read the chapter completely and I'm looking at that, every one of the tribes were giving these gifts. They were all equivalent. There had to be something here. So it was to sit down, prepare this sheet, and take a look at the numbers. Now, here again, we have 18720. Whether we look at this as July 18th, 2020, whether we look at this as July 18th, or whether we look at this as the midnight cry, 187 has had a lot of different points within this history. When I added up all of the bowls, we have a total of 840 shekels, but we have 10,000 80 grains. The numbers here, with the inclusion of one extra zero, would still point to the helic, the measuring of time in the Jewish system.
Okay. In the chat, it's saying that the General Conference incorporated the 26th of April, so 426 of 1948. Does this give us another 264? Most definitely, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now we come to 120 shekels of gold of the golden spoon. Multiplied by 12 grains, we come out to 1440, 1440. Is this not giving us a symbol of the 144,000? You would think. You'd, you'd hope so, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, you know, th this coincidence stuff is just far beyond coincidence. If, when you start seeing these numbers over and over and over again, um, it's like being hit in the face with a sledgehammer. I mean, really. Well, I mean... It, sledgehammer two by four whatever it is i mean we're getting smacked this yeah is... pretty hard i'm um, pretty hard yet when we take a good look at this all of this still winds up as a multiple of 2520 what are we to say here I look at it and I praise God. Look, my question yeah. is, is what exactly is all this stuff getting to? I mean, can we now take a lot of the stuff that we're finding and go back to the measurements of the temple and start equating some of this stuff? I would uh, think we can. Let's look at it. We have a message, and I, but I'm still not getting it, I'm, other than the fact of what we're learning. Yes, we have a message. Are we prepared to give the message is the question. I'm hesitant to say yes, but uh, my mind is going, no. I would have to agree, brother, with your mind. Was the church prepared to give the message of the third angel in 1888? No. Okay. Well, because it was a failure. Why was the church not prepared to give that message? Well, they weren't unit. There was there was no unity. I mean, there was some, but not much. There was a lot of rejection going on, especially in the 1888 era. Okay, I'll I'll submit it to you for your consideration. They were not prepared to give that third angel's message because they didn't understand the first two angels. Okay. That, that really sounds logical. Now, how can you give that third angel's message if you're not understanding the first two angels? If you, you can't. Don't, if you don't understand, fear God and give glory to him, how can you proclaim a message of judgment? If we do not, by our experience, understand the first two angels, then the third angel might as well be speaking Romulan. Something that never existed on this earth. Did you say Romulan? Yes, I did. <laughs> Are you tracky? <laughs> well, I could have said a couple of other things that would have been even more obscure, but we're going to use this. Now, here. Let's look at this even further. So we have the 156 years from 742 BC to 586 BC. From the time 
that it is decreed that Israel shall no longer be a people, and that's Israel and Judah, to the destruction of the temple. Now, from 1863, when this church is raised up, we have 156 years that bring us to 2019. In 2019, a message was being addressed. And I'm not referring to the warning of Nashville. We have a message that's being addressed to a movement to be prepared. Now, the 18720, we understand that. We have the 18th day of the seventh month. What was the 18th day of the seventh month, according to the Bible? What was the 10th day of the seventh month? Well, it's the uh, Day of Atonement. Right. Within five days after the Day of Atonement, what feast began? Tabernacle. So if we're looking at the 18th day of the seventh month, are we not in the midst of this Feast of Tabernacles? Yeah, I would say so. And what was the Feast of Tabernacles? Was it not a celebration that this year was almost over? That the work was about done? Because by the end, they had celebrated that the work was complete. The harvest was in. The grain, the grapes, everything was complete. And depending on the year that they were in, if this was a jubilee year, if it was a jubilee year, then they were going to have no more sowing that would have to be done for three years. So think about that for a moment. The 10,080 grains can point to a helic, a measurement of time. We are not to have a message hung upon time. The Millerites were not to have a message hung upon time. We did exactly what the Millerites had done in hanging a message upon time. But it was a message that was to be given to the world on July 18th of 2020. The message was to go out. The attention of the world was brought upon Nashville and upon a little group that had the backbone to stand up and say, Nashville is about to be destroyed. What if that little group is represented by the Golden Spoons? Interesting point. Okay. Now, one of the points that I looked at, here we have all of the tribes, including the tribe of Levi, represented with different gifts or different items that had to do with the consecration of the tabernacle. All of these tribes 
Judah, Issachar, Zebulun. These tribes made their offerings in the order in which they were encamped around the tabernacle. Levi received what they were to receive first. Does this not show us the importance in our lives of putting God first in everything that we do? Yeah, sure does. Agree. Okay. Now we have, when I looked at this, these sons, starting with Levi. Levi being the third son. Would he not have some representation of that third angel's message where we need to be putting God first in our lives? We come through this step by step. Levi was the third son. Judah was the fourth son of Leah. Issachar was the ninth in birth order, but was still of Leah. Zebulun was the tenth, yet of Leah. Reuben was the first, firstborn of Jacob and Leah. Gad and Simeon, Simeon being the second born, Gad being the seventh born, but of Zilpah the handmaiden. The tribes in order of where they lived from the nearest to the temple to the different sides of the temple. The sons of Rachel, not of the handmaiden, but the sons, her sons, are the ones that came next. Whether we're dealing with Ephraim, Manasseh, or Benjamin. And then three of the sons of the handmaidens came last. All gave equally. Does this not show that God treats us all equally? That if we come to him in spirit and in truth, they're all equal in his sight. All the way through this, we have numbers and we have order. Is this not how God would have it be? In order. Not with one being thought of being greater than the other. But that all are equal. Yeah, they equally contributed. They, they were equally requested upon to do these things. Yeah. Um, yeah, God, God's definitely a, a person or a, a entity that treats everybody the same. So from the least to the most, all are equal in his sight. Agreement. Okay. Now. There have been many points, many thoughts that have been coming out from some of these studies. There are directions that we are being pointed in that have to do with our preparation 
to be able to teach and empower others in the message of the third angel. So that as we come to a clearer understanding of the third angel's message, we will see it. We will see where the righteousness of Christ has been presented. We will see that this is not just a warning message, but it is also an invitation. When we receive an invitation, such as to a wedding, is it not normal that we should respond to say whether or not we're going to attend? Responde si vous plaît. RSVP. Where today is our response? That's part of the question that we're going to have to answer. As we come to understand more about the third angel's message, as we come to learn and look upon these, quote, minor prophets, and we begin to study these further in conjunction with the book of Daniel, there will be much more for us to see. As we're going through this in the book of Joshua, there are many points that begin to jump off the page. All of this came because we were involved in the study of Joshua 17. All of this came because instead of overlooking that dry and boring thing that's called mathematics, we started to look at numbers as a symbol. If there is a verse in the Bible that tells us that we should be looking for these numerical symbols, what verse is that? Well, I'm thinking of Daniel uh, 8.13, for one. We are right on the same page, brother. Because if we are unwilling to follow the wonderful number, then are we not following our own inclination rather than God's? Most definitely. So we have we have a bit here. Now, I sent most of this up to Theodore. And I'm sure that he'll be getting these out. I, I've had to break the spreadsheet up into a couple of PDFs. I'll make sure that Theodore has the original spreadsheet so that anybody that wants it and that can open it can open it and take a look and you know give thoughts back. Yeah, I was going to request it uh, because I have a, a tendency of liking to mark things up so I can understand it more fully as time or sure. as information comes into me. I'll see to it that you get it. Yes, that would be very kind. I'm still working on that uh, that symbology. Um, Excel sheet that I've, I'm building. Sure. And this just, it just keeps getting fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter because of stuff like this. <laughs> I can send you guys out what I've got so far, but. Okay. Isn't it amazing how that works? I mean, I've, I've got one file that years ago, I just, I labeled it church. And I have I have notes on different things using Excel, using Word, different, different copies of documents that I put together, that I've been led to put together, that I've been sent. 
And I look at these and I just go, wait a minute, how? How can so many of these things have been staring us right in the face? And yet we've really not seen them before. It's about timing. Yeah. And whose timing is it about? <laughs> it's definitely not my timing. <laughs> well, it's not my timing either. <laughs> not at all. Okay. I kind of know why Felix was looking at uh, Paul the way he was, you know, when he was going. I think, I think you've studied too much. I'm paraphrasing, but that's, that's kind of what I see in this whole thing. Uh, and number two, some people, when you start giving them some of the details, right? It's, it's like their eyes gloss over and roll back in the back of their head. Yeah, nobody, nobody wants to hear this stuff. I mean, um, that's too close to the bone. Well, I, I look at a lot of these things. I mean, I've always been a student of history. I've been a student that enjoys numbers. For some reason, numbers stick in my head. So when I start to see something and I, I'm seeing a pattern, I'm being shown a pattern, I want to ask why. And this was, this was just one of those whys. One other point, and then we're going to go on for a moment into, into another area. I found it very interesting when I'm going through this with the animals, we go here and each of the tribes was to present a bullock. Each of the tribes, a ram and a lamb. All of these were to be for the burnt offering. For the sin offering, we have one kid of the goats. Here again. One, 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 one. Now we come here to the peace offering. And we have two oxen, five rams, five he goats, and five lambs. There was a sister that noted that in each of these offerings, they were offered as males. But I'm going to point this out. We have one being shown four times. We have two once. We have five three times. Are the repeats of one, 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 showing us that we have one God, one Son, one Holy Spirit, and one gospel? Are this of the two oxen being that we have two to show us that this one Bible, we have the two books, Old and New Testaments. But here we also have rams, he goats, and lambs. We have those that would be the five wise virgins We have the rams as the gospel was first being given. We have the he goats during the time of the Millerites and in our time 
we have those that would be lambs. Because are the 144,000 not described as being those that will follow the lamb wherever he goeth? Right yep. that. Yep. Do lambs follow goats? Do lambs follow rams? Do lambs follow the oxen? No. I always thought the herds were separate. They, uh, yeah, they just tread on the path that they treaded on. Well, lambs like to follow other lambs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I live out in the country, and that's kind of true. I had the experience of going to a sheep ranch several years ago and seeing how things worked. And it was interesting to me that lambs would follow other lambs even if they were following them into an area that they should not go yeah i've, I've seen stuff like that too so here we have in a peace offering something that shows us for this time that lambs are part of this offering. And I would submit to you that the 144,000 would need to be as lambs to be able to follow Christ. He is our shepherd, but he is also the lamb of God. So that's just that, that's just some of the other symbolism that has come out here from Numbers chapter 7. Now, it was interesting to me as well, because this was Numbers and the number 7. So the wonderful numberer has placed in book number 7 of the book of Numbers, an example for our time. It's up to us whether we are going to accept this. It's up to us whether we are going to choose to study it. All right. Testimony 23. You will also find this in three testimony, pages 270 and forward. There are many who do not have the discretion of Joshua and have no special duty to search out wrongs and to deal promptly with the sins existing among them. Let not such hinder those who have the burden of this work upon them. Let them not stand in the way of those who have this duty to do so. Some make it a point to question and doubt and find fault because others do the work that God has not laid upon them. These stand directly in the way to hinder those upon whom God has laid the burden of reproving and correcting prevailing sins in order that he might, in order that his frown may be turned away from his people. Should a case like Achan's be among us, there are many who would accuse those who might act the part of Joshua in searching out the wrong of having a wicked fault-finding spirit. God is not to be trifled with and his warnings disregarded with impunity by a perverse people. Mrs. White is very direct here. And it's words that need to be heard now. There are points that are being brought out that are not easily addressed. Our minds are darkened because of over 6,000 years of sin. I know in my own experience 
that I have had trouble dealing with many things because of choices that I made earlier in my life. Much of this, I need to rely upon God to reveal to me, to show me what I need to do. There are those that have been showing us our need of stuff because we don't understand the points that are here. And yet when they bring these points out to us, for us to consider, there are others that are choosing to throw stones. He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. If we are, going to, if we are going to be accusing our brothers and sisters of being harsh, of being like the world, of saying things that, oh, well, you're not understanding what this person's point is. We're going to cut you off right now. Are we not doing the work of the adversary? Amen. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. I was shown that the manner of Aiken's confession was similar to the confessions that some among us have made and will make. Is this statement not prophetic? Well, yeah. They hide their wrongs and refuse to make a voluntary confession until God searches them out, and then they acknowledge their sins. A few persons would pass on in a course of wrong until they become hardened. They may even know that the church is burdened, as Achan knew that Israel was, were made weak before their enemies because of his guilt. Yet their consciences do not condemn them. They will not relieve the church by humbling their proud, rebellious hearts before God and putting away their wrongs. God's displeasure is upon his people. And he will not manifest his power in the midst of them while sins exist among them and are fostered by those in responsible positions. Yeah, that's pretty clear, isn't it? Is it direct enough, though, for us to understand? Yes, most definitely. I would say so. Can't get more direct than that. Yet, what's been happening over these last several weeks? Well, a lot of finger pointing and stuff, I guess. Okay. Um, now... I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to approach it in this way. And I've offended one when I approached it this way. I choose not to point fingers. Because the moment I'm pointing a finger at a brother and, or a sister, how many fingers do I have pointed back at me? Well, at least three. Agreed. Is that uh, anything to do with the, the three? <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't help that. My, my point, my testimony is this. When I made this comment to a brother, the comment that came back to me is, you are too much of the world. Too much of the world? Yep. That don't make any sense. <laughs> Not one. No, no sense at all. Okay. Now the point with this, I'm choosing not to point fingers. I am as guilty of the cross as were the priests of Christ's time. I know my guilt. I'm accepting my guilt. I come before Christ 
knowing that I am guilty of his death and it is for me that he died. I do not wish to have a spirit of Achan. I do not wish that my manner of confession hides wrongs. Because if God is going to have to search me out, I wind up just like Achan. Achan, his wife, his children, his possessions, his everything were destroyed. I'm not here to throw a stone. Just like the woman that was brought before Christ, caught in the act of adultery, she alone was brought. Her paramour, her partner in sin, was not. His sin was set aside by the people because they did not wish to follow what they had been told to do. I am not here, and I do not seek to be here, to burden this church, as Achan did. The point is to lift up brothers and sisters, to help them become strong in what is going on, not to attempt to weaken them. I get very frustrated when there are those that look to weaken my brothers and sisters and cause them to stumble. Did this not happen to William Miller? Were there not those around him yep. Yep. that created this issue? May it not be said of us. Those who work in the fear of God to rid the church of hindrances and to correct grievous wrongs that the people of God may see the necessity of abhorring sin and may prosper in purity and that the name of God may be glorified will ever meet with a resisting influence from the unconsecrated. Zephaniah thus describes the true state of this class and the terrible judgments that will come upon them. Let's take this sentence apart for a moment. Those who work in the fear of God to rid the church of hindrances and to correct grievous wrongs, that the people of God may see the necessity of abhorring sin and prosper in purity that the name of God is glorified. Are we not to abhor sin and therefore fear God? Does that not bring us to the understanding of glorifying God? Are they not the tenants the premises of the first and second angel's messages? What say you? Consider well, I, this. I got a, I got a observation. Please. Um, so that paragraph that you just started reading. Yes. first 15 words yeah. 17, the first uh, all the way up to the first uh, comma is that is that an implement implying uh, a mandate for us i don't like mandates <laughs> well that was just a, I, a I, term. Honestly, I, I honestly don't i mean Every, every time in this state, when they come out with a, with a, quote, mandate, I say, look, I'm sorry. I'm just not that way. <laughs> so 
Well, how would we look at that? Why not a commandment? Well, potato, potato. Why not, why not an instruction from God through the prophet to us? Well, that's exactly what I just said, but you know. I understand. You didn't, you, you didn't like mandate. No, I didn't <laughs> like mandate. I, <laughs> but yeah, in this, right. I can see why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In this, in this situation, brothers and sisters, Yes, I look at this as a very serious message. In this, Sister White again shows that Zephaniah thus describes the true state of this class and the terrible judgments that will come upon them. And Zephaniah is the book that we have been addressing. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees, that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. We have too many within the corporate church today that are saying, hey, yes, God's going to come. But, you know, God loves you. God loves you in your sin. God loves you so you can continue doing that which you wish. Now, in my life, I've had to ask the question. If God has given an instruction through the prophet, is this not to be followed? Um, yes. Okay. Believe the prophets and you shall prosper. All right. Now, I've had many times that I have walked into different Seventh-day Adventist churches. I have had plenty of times that I have been at different academies. If there is one item, let's say a food item that is normally presented, whether you're dealing with a potluck at a church or a meal at an academy, what is that one thing that the Adventist church is known for? You mean at a potluck? Yeah, at a potluck. Eggs? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Haystacks. Thank you. Haystacks, okay. And how are these haystacks normally constructed? They usually have a, a cheese. You usually put cheese on them and, and uh, some type of dressing. Okay. You know, something on them. Yet, what does Sister White say about cheese? It does not belong in the body. Unfit for human consumption. Well, the reason I became a Yet, why does the church choose to continue to ignore the words of Mrs. White? Why is this so important that they set this aside? <laughs> <laughs> flavor well body temple body is a temple of the holy spirit can the can the spirit be within a temple that is ignoring the word of god yeah no. foul spirit yeah foul, yeah foul spirit yeah the lord will not do good neither will he do evil the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteneth greatly. The voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, 
a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. You know, when you talked about that, Dwight, I brought that what Jesus said about if they break one, one of my least commandments. Yes, brother. All of them. <clears throat> Is that not a fearful statement? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, and it throws a monkey wrench into some of the reasoning I've heard why they do it. Anytime <clears throat> that stones are being thrown at others, we are finding that nails are again being driven into the hands and the feet of Christ. Yeah, we, we become the accuser. Now, this, as I went through this, as I had prepared all of this for the study in, Ze in Zephaniah, is a warning so deep yet is a warning so clear that I cannot see how we can set it aside. Question. Yes, please. Take your situation of the, the food that is served at a potluck that is not in keeping with the instructions God has given us. Yes. Um, why is that that it continues? Why, why do these things continue in our church? Is there not pride in the church that we have the true last message? Pride and rejection of the council. Well, uh, yes. But is there not also a desire not to call sin by its name, not to, not to give God, not to give reproach, even if it's on a one-to-one -one basis to another member because they might take it wrong. To me, this whole thing stinks and, and, and it is prevalent of political correctness gone to the very heart of our church where it has no place whatsoever. Amen. Yeah. Are we, was Christ ever politically correct? No, not really. He was always challenged by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the rulers. I they was even sure that they mocked them. Are we not to be following Christ? Amen. Um, yes. So if so, does that mean that we're going to have a politically correct message? Oh, absolutely not. That's why you think you're going to be hated. 
This, this is also why it's so difficult for people that still think of the church in terms of the world as far as the way people relate to each other. It's also why they have such a hard time receiving the spirit and the truth that God has given to them because, well, it's not packaged the way that it should be. It's offending, it's offensive, whatever. And the reality is, you know, it's a message for us. We need to receive it as it applies to us. And truth will offend. Truth definitely offends. Yes. Makes us feel very uncomfortable at times, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. More than just at times. Because the more we see the truth as it is in Christ, the more we begin to compare ourselves with him. Yeah, I, I, I find myself doing that more and more um, nowadays as before I wasn't so careful. Right. I think the point that's being brought out is the point that we need to consider now. That we need it in our lives on a daily basis. Because as I look at the title of this next paragraph, Do any of us wish to find ourselves in this situation? I would say no. So let's read this passage. When a crisis finally comes, as it surely will, and God speaks in behalf of his people, those who have sinned, those who have been a cloud of darkness and who have stood directly in the way of God's working for his people may become alarmed at the length they have gone in murmuring and bringing discouragement upon the cause. And like Achan, become terrified. They may acknowledge that they have sinned. But their confessions are too late and are not of the right kind to benefit themselves, although they may relieve the cause of God. Well, the character hasn't had been developed up to that point. We are, we are in a situation currently where stones have been thrown at some. Now, quite honestly, as I grew up, an old adage was being used. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will ever harm me? No. Negative. Words will never harm me. I'd rather get hit by a rock than words. Sometimes. Especially the words of a friend. Yep. I find it interesting over the last many Friday evenings that we have been able to study other parties' presentations and find much light within them. We may not fully agree with their conclusions, yet there is light in what was being presented. There are those that are still upset, however, at other light that's being presented. I'm sorry for those that are so upset. I'm sorry for those that are currently throwing the stones. Because I fear for their salvation.
Such do not make their confessions because of a conviction of their true state and a sense of how displeasing their course has been to God. If we are murmuring and bringing discouragement to others and unto the cause, is that not displeasing to the course of God? God may give this class another test, another proving, and let them show that they are no better prepared to stand free from all rebellion and sin than before their confessions were made. They are inclined to be ever on the side of wrong. And when the call is made for those who will be on the Lord's side to make a decided move to vindicate the right, they will manifest their true position. Those who have been nearly all their lives controlled by a spirit as foreign to the spirit of God as was Achan's will be very passive. When the time comes for decided action on the part of all, they will not claim to be on either side. Time will tell. That, to me, is a damning statement. The power of Satan has so long held them that they seem blinded and have no inclination to stand in defense of right. If they do not take a determined course on the wrong side, it is not because they have a clear sense of the right, but because they dare not. Brothers and sisters, these are not my words. These are the words of the prophet. If you've got a problem with them, take it up with her. And if you have a problem with what she has written, who is the ultimate author? Of course, Christ is. Christ. So if God is the ultimate author of this, and we have a problem with what he has written, what he has caused to present. Oops. <clears throat> oops. Nice. Okay. God will not be trifled with. It is in the time of conflict that the true color should be flung to the breeze. It is then that the standard bearers need to be firm and let their true position be known. It is then that the skill of every true soldier for the right is tested. Shirkers can never wear the laurels of victory. Those who are true and loyal will not conceal the fact, but will put heart and might into the work and venture their all in the struggle. Let the battle turn as it will. God is a sin-hating God, and those who encourage the sinner, saying, it is well with thee, God will what? God curse. curse. Confessions of sin made at the right time to relieve the people of God will be accepted of him. But there are those among us who will make confessions, as did Achan, too late to save themselves. God may prove them and give them another trial for the sake of evidencing to his people that they will not endure one test, one proving of God. They are not in harmony with right. They despise the straight testimony that reaches the heart and would replace or would rejoice to see everyone silenced that gives reproof. I praise God that we are yet receiving a warning. When the message goes, 
when the third angel's message goes to this world, it is to be given in power, in light, and in glory. There will be no stumbling. For this is a final message. This is a message that is to reach the heart. It is to shake up the heart. Jones and Wagner knew that they had a message that was unlike that which was being given by the church. They knew that this was the last church in earth's history. They knew this was the final time because the time of the end had come in 1798. The time of the end had come in their past. The time of the end came in our past, well before any of us were alive. We are living on borrowed time today, brothers and sisters. We do not have a message that is hung upon time. We have a message from God himself. And it's time for us to wake up that this message that is coming to us to prepare us is not one that we're to cast stones upon. We are, like the Millerites, to study these messages. Was there light in what Colin had been presenting? Yes. Was there light in what Odilio has presented? Yes. Has there been light in what Theodore has been presenting? Yes. Yep. If we are throwing stones on any, then we are standing against God. Standing against the light. Is that what we wish to do, is to stand against the light that he is giving for our salvation? Mm. Won't last long. No, we won't. Uh, I thought the whole objective was everlasting life. Amen. God will not be trifled with. We cannot pick up his banner one day and then lay it down. We cannot be wishy-washy. We cannot straddle the fence. When Balaam went to curse Israel, when he was riding the ass, and he came between the walls of the vineyards, what happened to him? Got his foot smashed. It was smashed against the wall of the vineyard. Was he near the vineyard? Yes. Was he able to see the vineyard? Possibly. Was he able to partake of the vineyard because of the wall? No. Or, well, yeah, he was not able to participate because of the wall. Okay. What does the vineyard represent to us today? Mm, God's children. How about doctrine? Okay, yeah, because it's wine. Okay. The ass was able to see the what may well have been Christ before them with the flaming sword. Balaam was given a warning through the mouth of a donkey. Was Balaam cognizant 
of the importance of this message? Um, evidently no. not. No, he wasn't. He didn't have his bearings. If we are to throw stones at other brothers and sisters, are we not then much like Balaam? Roger that. Okay. <clears throat> We've covered a few points. In this portion of Testimony 23 that we also find in Third Testimonies, we find a witness that links us to our study in the book of Zephaniah. This coming week, we're going to return to some of the things that we are looking at, both from Zephaniah and 1 Kings. There is much we will need to be taught, we will be need to be talking about. Say so enough, you say Zephaniah and 1 Kings? Yes. That'll be our study then. Correct. Okay. Because Zephaniah is one of those so-called minor prophets that Mrs. White says should be studied along with the book of Daniel. Yeah, Zephaniah is apocalyptic too. Very much. It's very much an end time type of prophecy. Now, do you have any other questions or any other comments? Not at this time. Okay. Uh, I, I'd just like to say, wow. <laughs> Praise God. About, I want to see that. I want to see that uh, Excel sheet if possible. Okay. You will have it. <laughs> Brother on you will have it. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank All you. Right. All right. Shall we close with prayer? <laughs> Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your warnings and for your opportunities. Father, I ask you forgive those that are throwing stones, for they know not what they do. Be with us today. We thank you for this Sabbath. We thank you for your, the opportunities we have to study. We thank you for the opportunities we have to come together. To be guided by you. To be shown by you. To be lifted up as your ensign at the end of the world. Direct us, please. Be with us. Bless us on this Sabbath. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Recording stopped.